All right, I see we've got a, a crowd coming in. So we'll, we'll uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We'll wait another minute or so to um, allow everyone to join. Okay, I think we should get started. So um, thank you again for everyone who's here in the audience and, and joining us. And, and thank you as well to uh, Manu Gusain, our speaker for today. We appreciate you joining us for the talk as well. Um, so the talk that we'll be hearing is um, gonna be about convergence research needs for 5G. And I, I suppose the, the main question to be answered is, is it an edge cloud or radio network? And um, uh, I think everyone has heard of 5G, whether they're working on it actively from a research perspective or just heard about it in the news, we realize that it's a major part of technology and, and the marketplace going forward. So I think this is a very relevant talk for, for 2021. Um, our, our speaker, uh, Mr. Gusain, is a, tech, a senior technical program director for uh, PAWR and the Director of Industry Engagement for the Institute of Wireless Internet of Things at Northeastern University. Um, and so he's in charge of setting strategic goals and the research agenda for a $100 million public-private partnership for the NSF platforms for advanced wireless research. That's the PAWR acronym I referred to earlier, as well as um, a DARPA Coliseum uh, program. Um, he is a board member for the Open Air Interface, uh, Software Alliance, uh, and a few other, uh, another foundation as well, and a university representative for a couple other projects and organizations and committees. Uh, so it sounds like you're very entrenched in, in this topic. So I think we're going to hear a lot of good uh, perspectives. Um, he's an IEEE senior member and received his MS degree from Tufts and an MBA from Boston University with, with high honors. So we're very much looking forward to, to hearing from you today. Thank you for, for joining us once again. Um, and uh, before we, we jump into it, I just want to remind the audience that we do have uh, a Q&A function built into this webinar. So if you happen to have a question, please feel free to, to enter, it through, enter it through the Q&A. Uh, we'll be monitoring that and, and uh, making sure that we get to your questions. Um, and with that, uh, whenever you're ready, uh, Manu, please feel free to take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to be, uh, be here. Um, so this is, I'm, I'm going to use this as an opportunity again, not to necessarily go deep uh, into any particular area, but try to be, or try to come at this through the lens of, you know, what does actually convergence research mean? For those who've been paying attention to the National Science Foundation, this is really a big uh, hot topic, uh, which is talking about interdisciplinary technologies that come together and address scientific challenges. And uh, frankly, from our perspective, from my perspective, I can't think of anything better than uh, what we are doing in, in, in 5G and developing research infrastructure that supports the research in this particular domain. Um, I pose a question of, you know, with 5G being an edge cloud or a radio network, uh, the answer is it's all of the above and much more. And that's what I want to parse through in this conversation. I'm again cognizant of um, the, you know, the breadth of experience that's probably uh, here in the colloquium with the students um, early, uh, early stage faculty, postdocs, as well as, you know, senior faculty who will probably know way more about this topic than, than I do. So my hope is to sort of uh, stimulate some thinking, uh, motivate some of the, the conversation, uh, especially for the students who are looking early on in the coursework on, or how to structure their degree programs. And I hope to be able to share just some of the, 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 the knowledge that, you know, I've gained on the ground in this particular area and sort of bring that over and, and, and share it with you. So by way of introduction, again, it was, uh, um, you know, nice kind words that, that were said, but just to sort of add a little bit more color and context. Uh, primarily, um, I'm part of the Institute for Wireless Internet of Things at Northeastern, which is an institute founded in late uh, uh, 2019. So we're relatively young. Uh, primarily we are coalescing all of our wireless research domains under that single umbrella 
And uh, the flagship project for this is the NSF BAWR program of which uh, NCSU is a lead. And we will talk about that very briefly. Uh, in addition to that, we also coalesced all of our um, expertise and on the ground knowledge across all of these consortia. It's, uh, I apologize, it's an alphabet soup, um, but I'll, I'll try to be very clear as to what each of these entities, organizations, consortia, alliances are doing, because this, frankly speaking, is a very rich ecosystem where an academic can actually get involved um, and uh, there is no cost to it. And actually, uh, if nothing else, it, it really allows you to understand and learn what's happening in the ecosystem and the openness that's been afforded in 5G uh, due to some technical and strategic um, reasons uh, for industry members to open the ecosystem, open the technologies, actually acts as a catalyst uh, for some of our uh, students and our next generation workforce to really get the early experience and try to absorb that into their curriculum and into their practical project work. Uh, so I wanna make sure that that's, that's all um, also addressed here. Uh, we also manage and operate again, uh, lots of uh, cool uh, research infrastructure on behalf of the NSF. I'll talk briefly about Coliseum, which is the world's largest channel emulator. And, and we have that facility here at Northeastern that's open to uh, uh, researchers remotely. So anybody uh, here with an academic affiliation can log on, request an account and, and, and move forward. And then just the telecom industry consortium, again, we, uh, we interface, talk, manage, uh, solicit contributions from about 35 companies across the entire value chain. And I'll sort of talk about that. So just wanted to calibrate on, you know, what experience I'm, I'm, I'm bringing and what viewpoints I'm trying to coalesce and converge and try to make sense of this very broad ecosystem for the audience here today. So just to uh, kick things off again, you know, always the problem statement first um, and, you know, talk about limitations of uh, the, the current or why we needed to make that jump from 4G to 5G and, and where we are in, in, in 5G. So with 4G, the issue was monolithic ar architectures, which were proprietary or uh, hardware based. So the idea was that you had a particular vendor and you had to buy a particular solution or the entire network uh, portfolio from one particular vendor. Again, the advantages were these were tightly vertically integrated. The interfaces were proprietary. So you as a, a user of the network or an operator of the network didn't necessarily have the flexibility to modify or change anything. And the ability to reconfigure or add programmability or the concepts of software defined uh, X were not, um, were not available. So as 5G was being uh, thought of, and just to pay a little bit of lip service to how these networks are evolved, how they're defined, uh, this is all done under a standard setting or organization entity called 3GPP. Primarily there are other entities as well, but that's where a lot of the, the network specifications are, are discussed, debated, ratified, and then those specifications come out that are then implemented by the engineers. Uh, so for 5G, again, to remind the clock, this happened somewhere in the 2016, uh, time frame where the first release uh, came out. And even up until now, a commercial actual deployment where you as a user can go out and look at, an, look at your handset or go uh, purchase a 5G uh, solution that hasn't come to fruition yet. We're on the way there. Uh, one of the, uh, the major operators here has lit up what they call 5G service in certain markets. But right now it's, it's mostly just a mirage because it's just a 4G network that has been enhanced uh, a little bit. So that's the gory detail, gory reality of where things are today. Um, other issues are programmatic control, especially at large scale. So this comes for people who are looking at it from a network um, domain uh, problem, uh, especially at controlling uh, the network at a large enough scale, different radio access points, different uh, edge compute clusters, different cloud clusters, and how do you actually control them? How do you configure them? And this is where uh, the issue of what you guys are learning in class uh, actually um, translates over to um, domain specific or uh, management and orchestration of these networks. And there's a huge uh, gap that exists in these 4G, 5G kind of networks. And then the biggest thing always has been traffic. Again, uh, last year, you, you've all seen what, what, has, uh, what has happened with the, with the COVID pandemic and the increased traffic demands and the stress that it put on the network. So again, the bandwidth requirements continue to grow. Uh, we are voracious users of data and will continue to be. And that's primarily, um, you know, 
where 5G networks need to go to address that, that traffic uh, demand. So that's just to set the problem uh, context for where we're coming from or what the need for 5G networks is uh, primarily. So now I want to sort of uh, walk through again that, that first element I talked in, in the talk title, which is the convergence research. Um, you're going to, I'm, I'm going to go through very quickly some of the key enabling technologies. And what you will see are this draws from various scientific disciplines. Um, some of those that you are probably looking at, some of those you probably are not very familiar with. But the key message here is all of these technologies in some combination are what are con is contributing to an end-to-end -to -end realization of a 5G network. Uh, first and foremost, maybe walking down from the networking um, uh, side, so walking from um, the, the, the network uh, piece of a 5G network, uh, the enabling technology on 5G uh, borrows heavily from the concept you see in cloud and data center networking uh, centered around software-defined networks, SDN. This is primarily a key concept that allows you to disaggregate or separate the control and user plane of the traffic. So in monolithic or in previous generations of architectures, your actual uh, networking device had the control plane very tightly coupled on top. And again, it was done primarily uh, from a vendor um, lock-in perspective. So if you had a Cisco switch, you had to use what came um, with um, the, the controller that came with the Cisco switch, and you couldn't necessarily use anything else. But the idea to disaggregate the control plane and insert a controller in between the application that needs to define what its uh, key metrics are and how does that get translated and implemented on the actual network element, um, that was done um, very directly. But now with SDN, the idea of centralizing this control into an SDN controller, and all these acronyms that you see here are various different projects in the 5G or the telecom domain uh, that have contributed to or have certain implementations uh, that allow you uh, to apply the SDN concepts in the in in a 5G uh, network, and this is primarily talking about the the network side of the house. So this is the the core network, or where when the bits uh, reach uh, a gateway. This is not addressing the radio access or the radio part, which we'll see um, uh, very shortly. So SDN, that's that that's what it allows. It's it's a very mature and well developed field. I'm, uh, Sure, some of you are taking courses in this uh, field, and this is um, uh, quite quite an interesting um, uh, venue and a very very strong demand for engineers uh, who who understand and have a hands-on experience with these with these concepts. Uh, the other one, quite related to SDN, is NFV, Network Function Virtualization. This is what's uh, looking at it primarily from an infrastructure side of the house. So, commodity servers, be it x86 or ARM-based uh, servers. And the ability to virtualize the actual underlying hardware uh, to have isolation of multiple different network functions you may, you may have. So this could be your middleware boxes. This could be your firewalls. Uh, this could also, and this applies very strongly in the context of a 5G core network into the different uh, functions that, that manage the user plane functionality, the control plane functionality, in some cases billing, in some cases policy, in, in some cases service management orchestration. So this is again a key concept borrowed very heavily from the data center and cloud community and been applied to a, um, a 5G uh, network. And again, the key construct or the key concept here is you develop these network functions that are very tight, very specific, and you have the ability to sort of mix and match or make clusters of these virtual network functions, stitch them together under the concept of service function chaining, and then layer them on top of uh, the physical hardware using virtualization layers, either virtual machines and most recently uh, containers, uh, Kubernetes and, and, and Docker. And then how do you manage them? Using the virtual network function manager to instantiate and manage these VMs, uh, Dockers uh, or, or containers. And then moving into the radio realm, uh, for 5G, it's not, it should not be thought of as just purely a network. And again, as I alluded to earlier, it should be seen as a network of networks. So on the radio side, and again, now moving a little bit into the, into the um, electronics or the electrical engineering uh, side of the house, now we're looking at uh, radio frequencies. And primarily that are you know, broadly classified in, in three different categories from low band, um, mid-band and, and high-band, or what we now also refer to as millimeter wave. Um, Low-band is something that has been a, a workhorse 
Um, this is frequency that's, you know, uh, lower frequency, higher wavelengths. So you remember your frequency wavelengths dependency uh, equations. And what uh, the low band allows you to do is provide a larger coverage, but at lower data rates. So again, if you look at it through uh, capacity and coverage, you actually get a lot of coverage, but you get very little capacity uh, with these links or uh, small bandwidths. Moving up the spectrum into mid band, which is where predominantly uh, 4G uh, was, was very heavily deployed and 5G will be deployed for mostly the metro uh, area networks where now you see a bump in what capacity can be um, uh, afforded by these uh, frequencies. So this is something that starts at, at the 2.1 to 2.5 gigahertz uh, range and goes all the way up uh, to six or in now with recent FCC rulings up to 7.1 uh, gigahertz. And, and this is, and an astute observer would also understand that this is where Wi-Fi uh, works. And that is also part of the strategy from an operator on a 5G network is to use various heterogeneous wireless technologies and tie them all back together uh, to provide, again, at the end of the day, the best capacity and coverage uh, that, that you can. Moving into the realm of millimeter wave, and again, you know, you, you're very fortunate at NCSU to have world leading researchers who are working on millimeter wave uh, systems and implementations. And this is uh, categorically, uh, categorically you know, thought of as 30 to 300 gigahertz. So very, very high frequency, very small pencil-like beams, so very small narrow bandwidth, uh, narrow wavelengths, but very high capacity uh, links that can be uh, developed. So this is where the dense urban, small short range, but high speed, sort of almost bordering to fiber connectivity uh, can come. And this is the spectral diversity of where 5G is going to be deployed. And then the secret that the carriers or the operators won't tell you would be what's called carrier aggregation, which is where multiple different swaths of these bands are actually stitched together and used to provide service when uh, depending on the availability of uh, spectrum. So that's a little bit about spectrum diversity 5G. Staying with the radio access networks and the radio side, on the 4G side, the traditional approach, and this should be a picture that most of you are familiar with, the macro cell approach where you had this traditional vendor, you were locked into a particular vendor and you had a vertically integrated a single solution for a radio access network, be it the antenna, the baseband processor, and everything in between. Now we're looking at what, are, what is called virtualized RAN or CRAN or cloud RAN, uh, comes in different, uh, multiple different names. But the idea is to take some of the intelligence and distribute it across between the antenna and the actual compute that needs to process the digitized samples uh, once they're converted on the radio front end from analog to digital uh, domain and to disaggregate the radio access network. So now you have the ability to actually uh, deploy the intelligence or the functionality based on the use cases that you want to. And this is something I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. So this is what's, uh, what's uh, termed as cloud ran or was, was termed as cloud ran. Now this is an older picture, but think of it as horizontal disaggregation. So think of the antenna system that you see, what are called the remote radio heads, the RRH. And uh, usually it's connected with a very high capacity link uh, or what's called the front hall network back to a baseband processor, which is where the digitization uh, happens. And then the digital samples go using a backhaul uh, either into the core network or to an edge network uh, to process the information that's been received. Uh, primarily uses a very well known, but proprietary uh, CIPRI, uh, CPRI, a common public radio interface. This is proprietary to each vendor. So each vendor has their own implementation of this particular standard. And this has been a major, major bottleneck in uh, deploying uh, traditional networks. Now with, the, uh, with this horizontal disaggregation, what you've moved to is this concept or this notional concept of disaggregating the baseband unit and the radio uh, resource set combination into three or four different elements. And this can be the intelligence, quote unquote, can lie all the way at the radio level, the, the remote radio head, or it can lie somewhere in the middle at the centralized unit or at the distributed unit. And these are what are termed as now uh, different functional splits. So functional splits are split across uh, where the intelligence is gonna lie. Um, there are, uh, again, some of these um, places or these references on the slides that I'd encourage you to, to look at. Small cell forum, this is one, um, uh, one group that talks about a particular split called option six. 
where they are talking about keeping most of the functionality on the on the central, um, uh, sorry, on the distributed unit side and um, keeping the antenna elements a little bit uh, closer or tightly coupled with the distributed unit. On the other hand, there is ORAN Alliance. This is a word that you've probably begun to hear and I'll talk a little bit more about it. And they have an option split called option 7.2, which primarily looks at keeping majority of the intelligence on the centralized unit side and keeping the remote radio head uh, units as primarily just active antenna systems and keeping the intelligence more tightly on the compute or on the digital side uh, of the house. So this is what's known as functional splits. Again, terminology may have already come across. Key key enabler around 5G. And again, from an operator perspective, it allows them to break the shackles of traditional tier one vendors and buy their solutions from different folks and interface them because all of these interfaces are supposedly uh, defined uh, by standardization bodies or specification bodies. This is ORAN that you've uh, um, uh, maybe heard of, and if not, I very uh, strongly recommend that you look at what uh, ORAN is, because this is what is the amalgamation of the SD and NFV concepts we talked about and the radio access network. So this is bringing that concept very close to the radio. Um, again, uh, alphabet soup, I, I don't want this to become a lecture on, on ORAN and its specifications, but the, the key idea is horizontal disaggregation. So I already showed you the remote radio head unit called the ORU in or, um, ORAN parlance, a distributed unit that lives uh, much closer to the radio and a central unit that could live anywhere else. The key thing to learn or, or to take away from here is this notional concept of a RIC, a radio intelligent controller, not too dissimilar to the software defined uh, controller that um, works with the SDN uh, paradigm. And what this radio intelligent controller does is it allows you to control different primitives for the central unit, distributed unit or the radio unit based on what sort of uh, service uh, that the or the uh, that, that the application actually needs, and what are the metrics and the KPIs that you need to meet, be it latency related or capacity uh, related, and all these uh, uh, things are also split across near real time because, as you know, the closer you are to the radio, uh, the faster you need to turn around uh, the information. So you have uh, sub millisecond latency requirements, and then as you move up the stack, the latency requirements are a little bit relaxed uh, between. Uh, 50 milliseconds to close to one, uh, one second. And that's what's handled by what's called the non-real-time radio intelligent controller. So hopefully this sort of ties it together um, for everyone involved. Uh, now sort of to switch, uh, uh, switch the topic areas into what I earlier alluded to, which is this whole notion of openness in, in the 5G domain. Um, for those um, on, on either the faculty side or some of the postdocs, uh, PhDs who've looked at 4G initially, it was an ecosystem that was very, very closed. And from an academic lens, it was very hard to stand up or have in-house access to a 4G network that you could actually play with, um, stand up software implementations for, and really sort of um, do experimentation and research or even practical um, uh, lab-based experiments that you would uh, want to do in your coursework. So now with 5G, there is this whole ecosystem that's come about. Uh, the, the most important one of them uh, we feel is the Open Air Interface Software Alliance that releases softwareized implementations of the 5G stack. They've done so for the 4G stack as well, but this is what I would encourage you if you're really keen on learning what's happening in 5G. These are stacks that you can instantiate on a server, um, uh, not necessarily the radio part for a radio, you'd need a USRP, um, or an FPGA with a, a radio front end to actually do over the air experimentation. But this allows you uh, the, you know, is, is a key building block that allows you to understand how these different protocol stack elements are sort of implemented. What you see on the screen is the current state, uh, state of implementation of the different um, layers of the protocol stack that need to be developed all the way from the low level hardware driver. So if you are very keen in DSP and real time FPGA, deployment and development, that's where you'd want to focus. As you move up the stack on the FI and the Mac layer or uh, RLC, PDCP, as you sort of move up uh, the stack, you want to do scheduler optimization, you want to look at the Mac layer. This is the key basic implementation that you can set up uh, sitting in your uh, campus, uh, on your laptops, and uh, have the ability to sort of have this instantiated for you. And then you can sort of really take a hard and careful look at the areas that, that you'd 
uh, you'd want to look at. So the openness paradigm in 5G makes it very, very cool. And for the first time really allows you even at this level at your undergrad or graduate level to really get your hands dirty um, and, and sort of come out of the other side with a clear hands-on experience as to how these uh, telecom networks and these protocol stacks are actually uh, working in unison from the radio access all the way to the core side. And um, these are sort of, so this is what I, I have just said, right? So this is all about uh, looking at the entire network. So I talked about the radio access network, which is at the bottom, uh, which is what's being primarily built by uh, open alliances like Open Air Interface or SRS LTE. And it also applies to the user equipment, which are the handsets or software defined radio uh, implementations that, that are uh, sort of needed um, in, in here. And as you move up the stack on the radio access network side, uh, you have all these different implementations that are available. The one thing you're probably thinking of as you look at this is, oh my God, I don't know where I need to get started. So what we have done, and this allows me to pivot uh, to, to how you would instantiate what's in front of you and how you would even begin to make sense of where you'd want to address um, any optimization or any particular uh, issue that you'd want to address with respect to, I want to work on, a, on, on radio or I want to have a uh, look at millimeter wave uh, solutions, or I want to work on the core network side because what I really care for are building network functions, or I care about the actual networking or how do I stitch these different functions um, and um, uh, the middleware boxes, uh, firewalls, uh, et cetera, and how do I do this? So for that, uh, to pivot, um, and, and, and before I sort of go there, I want to make sure I pay uh, very strong attention because this ties into this entire stack which is the role of AI and ML in wireless and in 5G. So everything you see on this particular slide has a, uh, a place for um, AI and ML concepts for data science um, and the role of AI in this, in this network from, so it's a power tool, a powerful set of tools. And what this benefits from is that open paradigm, the open interfaces that live between each of these different elements, between the RAN and the core, the core and the edge, the edge and the RAN, and the RAN and the, the user equipment. The AI has a role across each uh, layer, be it closer to real-time radios or to the non-real-time um, array. But again, as, as you've already heard, for those who've taken data science uh, classes, you know AI is only as good as the data that you have to train your models or to do machine learning or apply those concepts. So the notional uh, piece here is AI is as good as, as the data. And for a 5G network, where do you get the data? Um, we're, we're gonna look at that when we, when, we talk, when we move into the second half of the talk. But right now, just to sort of uh, close the loop for you with where AI uh, lives in this entire network ecosystem, all the way from the radio unit, moving all the way to the left into what's known as the core network. These are sort of the three places where you can, you can think of applying AI and ML. So deployment one would be a deployment where you need intelligence in the network, but very close to the radio because you have a very, very small uh, sub millisecond loop that needs to be closed between the radio that just has digitized or has analog signals that need to be processed. The distributed new unit needs to make a decision. It needs to learn the behavior of what's happening in the environment and very quickly in real time need to feed that information back uh, to the radio unit. It moves a little bit closer. The second loop is between 10 and 500 milliseconds when the information flows back to what's called the near real time radio intelligent controller. So this is the same paradigm as the SDN controller where you need intelligence in decision-making at a much more central level. So now this is gone away from the role of one single base station UE or one base station and multiple UEs to multiple base stations and multiple UEs. How do you aggregate that information? How do you absorb it? How do you synthesize this? How do you model it? And how do you use that to make a decision? And then you can apply it at multiple levels. And again, this talk is not about AIML, but this is again, a very rich field. And the point I'm trying to make here is that your, um, the, the, the skills that you're acquiring, if you're a computer science engineer or doing data science, are, is applicable on the other side, on the electrical, electronic side, on telecom networks, and primarily what you should look at it through the lens of data. 
and the data exists everywhere at the radio unit, at the DU, at the CU, at the near real time, and at the norm to real time rig. And whatever modeling uh, that you want to do, a very, very um, rich field right now uh, for uh, research and development, which is the intersection of AI ML across the entire protocol stack. So, so this was all motivated to uh, everything you heard about 5G enabling technologies, the complexities associated, the all the different elements of the stack. I now want to pivot to, so, you know, Manu, you've, you've, you've told us all these different uh, technologies that are uh, there that, are, that we can use, but where do we use it and, and what's there uh, out there that we can leverage um, to sort of implement, instantiate all of these key technologies. And that's what I want to talk about the PWR program, which was primarily founded with all of these issues in, in mind. So very quickly, just running through the PWR program sort of is, uh, uh, was started in 2017. So we're coming up on three years almost of uh, where uh, the program is. Uh, the program was kicked off and founded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, they stood up a power project office, which is co-led by us at Northeastern University and our partners at US Ignite, which is a 501c3 based in Washington, DC. And we were tasked with the, uh, with the mandate to develop four large scale test beds, test platforms that will allow to coalesce or provide large scale test facilities to wireless and computer science domain uh, researchers to conduct experimentation. Everything I said earlier, um, to instantiate it, to set it up, as you probably clearly have realized by now, requires a very vast uh, skill set. Um, this is not something uh, that one single person is going to be able to do, and it's pretty much beyond the purview of uh, somebody who's working in a lab ecosystem or um, is is a student or even a, a, a early PhD or a postdoc uh, researcher. So this was a pain point. The NSF realized that they converged and coalesced their resources and pooled in about $50 million to build these platforms. We went out and solicited a industry consortium that's 35 members strong. And these are all the companies you, you, you know, all the way from OTT players to tier one vendors, to fiber uh, network providers, to network equipment providers, to non-traditional people. Um, and, and a couple that I'll highlight are people who are doing uh, or looking at data and have come and joined the network because they've realized for 5G, the key currency is, is data and the availability of data and how do you model it, morph it to make smarter and more intelligent decisions. So these are the key, these are the power platforms. This is the portfolio we have uh, today. Uh, two platforms were chosen and these are, this, will all, this was all done in a staggered manner. So the green that you see are platforms that were selected in 2018. Uh, they've had two years of development, construction and uh, implementation time in which course they've deployed over their cities in Salt Lake City, Utah, in West Harlem, New York, a uh, large number of radios uh, out in the wild and then tied it all back with a, a fiber uh, network back into a large compute data center cluster that allows you to model uh, how 5G networks and not just 5G networks, how even in isolation, if you wanted to do um, software defined networking, uh, virtual network function instantiation, the ability to look at infrastructure as a service, platform as a service uh, on these uh, test networks, they're available today. And I'll have links at the end of the talk for you to go check these platforms uh, out. Each of them has a different flavor and they were that was done by design. Uh, the first two, uh, Powder at Salt Lake City, primarily looks at software defined networks. So everything on the concept of commodity hardware um, and then using the intelligence on the software side and the softwareization of these networks and how do you explore and exploit, the, um, exploit it. And on the radio side, primarily looking at massive MIMO, which is a concept where a large number of antennas are put together in the form of an array. And those arrays are used for spatial multiplexing to uh, really reuse the, the spectrum that's available in a much more uh, smarter manner. And this would, again, be an entire talk to talk about Massive MIMO, but I encourage you to sort of check out the powder test bed if you're interested to learn more. Cosmos in New York uh, talks primarily around millimeter wave research. Um, and this is again, 30 to 300 gigahertz in a very dense urban environment centered around Columbia University and moving eastward to City College of New York. And also has, uh, frankly, in, uh, in, 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 in my opinion, in our opinion as, as power, uh, the, the largest scale optical backhaul 
um, programmable network, which allows you to deploy and have access to these very cool reconfigurable optical ad drop multiplexers that allow you to do uh, switching in the physical domain. So actual light uh, on an optical uh, signal and then uh, sort of um, uh, bring that together with the millimeter wave um, networks that are generating large amounts of data and how do you move those across uh, different radio elements. So the, in, if you're interested to learn more, uh, please go visit Cosmos. Of course, your home platform, uh, AirPow here in um, uh, on campus at North Carolina State University. It's been um, uh, one year since award and the team uh, here is uh, really hard at work to sort of develop the uh, the radio and the network footprint that will allow you to really experiment. And this is the key uh, differentiator and key innovation on the AirPower platform is to look at unmanned aerial vehicles, mobility, and its interplay with frequencies in the mid band and in the high band millimeter wave space. And how does that uh, come together, especially when you add a third dimension, when you're flying something. So now it's no longer terrestrial two dimensional where your antennas are positioned here and can go this way or this way in the XY domain, but now you're adding the Z when you uh, fly your UAS uh, up into um, uh, up to the, the, the limits that the FAA allows you to do. And this would be something that would be the only place in the nation uh, that will enable that kind of experimentation. So um, that would be really cool for your, uh, uh, to have access in, in uh, so to say your backyard for this platform as it comes online in the next uh, six months or so. The last platform, completely different. We're looking at a rural broadband uh, platform uh, that will address the digital divide. That will look at why um, networks. We're talking. We're talking about gigabits per second. We're talking about five G. But really, about seventy percent of the population is still in areas that are underserved. So, how can we build a research platform that will stimulate the research? Uh, to address these issues in a rural context. And we are in the final stages of selection of that particular um, uh, platform. And right now there are two finalists that are vying for uh, the actual um, award and that's Iowa State University and University of Nebraska at Lincoln. I talked about Coliseum, which is the world's largest RF emulator and that fits into the power story. It's located here and I'll give you a little bit more details on what that, um, what, what that actually has. I'll really power through in the interest of time, uh, Powder Renew. Uh, primarily looking at, uh, as I said, it software defined um, radio nodes. So this is actual picture of uh, some of the radios that have been mounted. Uh, looking at the wide, uh, they're looking primarily in the low band and the mid band, and even in the mid band in multiple different frequency domains uh, in 2.5 to 2.7 gigahertz, where really is 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 a good rich propagation environment and 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 meets the capacity coverage uh, needs for uh, 5G networks. And then it has a very, very big fabric of um, a CWDM based topology, which basically has all the fiber at all these different RF sites pulled back into a data center where there is large amounts of compute um, and networking that's available to, to you as a user uh, for conducting your research. And it enables research in end-to-end -end programmable networking. Spectrum sharing, which is again, another paradigm uh, that I haven't talked about a lot, but that allows for coexistence of multiple different RF emitters uh, for those who own the spectrum and are authorized to use that spectrum, or if they're not using that spectrum at a high level, the concept is they allow somebody else uh, to use that. How is that coordinated? How that can actually be done is a completely, um, you know, oh, it's its own um, a field of investigation. And again, very rich right now because spectrum is a finite resource and right now, um, you know, majority of it is already spoken for. So the only next logical thing uh, for us as, as a country, as, as uh, um, a, a technical domain, as industry is to share that spectrum. And in terms of size and scope, this platform is going to cover about 2.3 square miles uh, centered around the University of Utah. If, if you've been to Salt Lake City, it's built in a valley. Uh, Salt Lake, uh, the University of Utah is on the east end and the platform is going to be built on campus and then move westward uh, to connect into the downtown Salt Lake City um, uh, area and covers about 2.3 square miles. So this is an active, um, you know, the, the resources are available. They're available from your laptop at a, at a click of a button. I very strongly encourage you to look at the tutorials they've developed and, and sort of look at uh, what they have. Similar to Cosmos, talked about millimeter wave, one square mile, very, very dense uh, urban deployment on rooftops, on street light poles, 
and with an optical high programmable network, tying it all back together uh, would be something that we really, really, um, uh, you know, a key capability that's not available to you in your lab ecosystem. So really encourage you to take the, um, take the opportunity to sort of look at what kind of resources are available, look at these tutorials and really familiarize yourself uh, in, in this particular domain if you are interested. Uh, air power again, primarily this, uh, these pictures should, uh, should look familiar. Looking at you know, fixed terrestrial software defined radios, but also uh, custom built drones uh, that are being built by your faculty and staff here that will have uh, RF emitters, transmitters mounted on them, and they're gonna be flown around multiple different areas. I'm sure you've seen these experiments happening locally as well. And the research focus is primarily the intersection of wireless and uh, non-terrestrial uh, mobility um, it, at multiple different frequencies. Uh, Colosseum, as I talked about, it, it is and still remains a very large uh, wireless network emulator. So similar in spirit, the same kind of infrastructure, commodity software defined radios with multiple different compute form factors, CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and the ability to conduct experimentation without having to do it over the air, uh, so to speak, as what our prior three platforms are, um, are, are doing right now and you can do this it's all uh, about 21 racks worth of equipment sitting in a in a warehouse uh, being monitored and operated by uh, my colleagues at northeastern university and allows you a, a very rich experimentation ecosystem for very basic wireless research coexistence looking at wi-fi 5g uh, cv2x uh, dsrc and all different protocol stacks uh, that can be uh, really easily modeled on this uh, on this facility so just to wrap things up, just to bring this all back home, right? We talked about all the 5G enabling technologies, and then I tried to connect the dots to the research infrastructure that is available to you as a researcher uh, sitting in a university today. And this is sort of just a canonical use case of how we envision uh, leveraging all of the different cool uh, enabling technologies that are available to us from a user perspective as a research enabler. So think of your softwareized container or what basically is a instantiation of a virtual network function or a virtual machine or a Docker container that is self-contained. And in this case, just to drive home the point, I've uh, taken the example of AIML. So think of your machine learning agent uh, and your data set that's accessible to you. You've built your cool little algorithm. You've tied it to a wireless technology, be it LTE, 5G NR or Wi-Fi. This is your, and you have your model that you want to execute this on. You can pick your container up that's been developed in-house, port it over, uh, test it out or validate it, maybe by simulation, maybe NS3, maybe MATLAB, maybe some other uh, AIML agents that you want to use to test and validate. Pick that container up, bring it over to Colosseum, uh, instantiate that in a much more controlled emulated environment. Again, validate that uh, functionality for what you have. And then if you think that you are ready to go and do experimentation actually out into the wild and really collect some real data or implement whatever uh, algorithms you have out in the real world and get a cool paper out of it, get um, and build some IP, build uh, technologies that can actually be um, used for solving any some real world challenges. This is sort of the pipeline that we advertise that is available to you as a researcher today uh, to take advantage of. And that's the, the other point I wanna make is this really simplifies your research. This really simplifies some of the implementation work you need to do, uh, amortizes where your effort needs to be put. And you should be thinking, uh, and this is a push that's going to come from the National Science Foundation in, in, in the out years, which is to leverage these research infrastructures uh, to drive home the notion of all these different uh, topical themes that are frankly out of scope for any individual researcher. So be smart, use these resources that are available to you. If you have a particular expertise in one of these areas, uh, amortize your effort and, and, and um, sort of instantiate things that, that you not, not necessarily are the expert in and really focus and uh, drive home uh, to enable yourself, enable your learning and enable your research. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pause here. I'll be happy to sort of take questions. Um, thank you again for your time and attention this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. 
So yes, we, we would love to take questions. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the uh, Q&A. You're also getting a virtual applause from the chat as well. <laughs> uh, but yes, please feel free to type in your questions into the Q&A and, um, and, and we'll make sure to get to them. Uh, I, I think maybe to, to get us started, I, I had one question and, and this is um, definitely influenced by my own research interest being more on the device level. A lot of what you discussed was um, network level data level uh, innovations and and I was kind of curious whether from a hardware perspective you see opportunities for for research uh, new devices you know going to galley mitride or Siggy uh, you know Siggy or things like that could you kind of comment on that as well yes yeah th thanks for that question so in in the context of what I talked about or through the lens I'm looking from from power it was strategically the decision was taken to really try to look at what industry already has or what our academic peers and partners can sort of build. So it was a system level decision. Um, and, and again, you know, in the power umbrella is probably not the right place to think of the key innovations you're looking at. Either you're looking at RFIC development, you're looking at new circuits, uh, you're looking at new radios, you're looking at new materials as you talked about. I think that, frankly speaking, that's that, that requires a level of investment and a level of commitment that has to be purely focused on that particular area um, in, its, in, in its own. And I know there are certain initiatives, obviously uh, there are some partnerships that NSF has with IBM, but that domain hasn't necessarily been a strong suit um, in there. Now, from a power perspective, there are actually a couple of people who are building uh, not necessarily devices, but on the power test bed, there are a couple of researchers who are antenna experts and they're building cool uh, antennas that can be uh, instantiated and be developed in the concept of what we call BYOD, bring your own device uh, that can be uh, sort of augmented uh, in front of. So if you have a cool new antenna design, uh, self-interference cancellation, whatever you want to do, you can bring that device up, use the rest of the system and, and be there. Now, and, and we know again, locally here, you, you have uh, very strong device experts, people who are building millimeter wave, uh, systems, radios, um, but those people, um, you know, we, 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 there is a, there needs to be a little bit of maturity in that research when it's ready to get to that system level that it actually can be brought onto a power infrastructure. So that's just primarily speaking from a power perspective, but really, you know, it is a very we will we will benefit once those innovations come uh, to fruition. And, and there is actually a business case and, you know, your foundries are building those circuits and you package those things correctly that we can actually field deploy uh, those. And we look forward to uh, sort of doing that at least for the millimeter wave. And now as we begin to talk at the 120, 240 and actual two terahertz frequencies. Fantastic, thank you. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you can't tackle the whole problem at the same time. So a certain yeah. level of maturity is necessary. <laughs> Uh, we actually have some questions that have come in, so I'll read them out. Uh, the first one is from Mikhail, who's, uh, who asks, can you talk a bit about the flavors of the two contenders for the fourth PAWR slot? Uh, yeah, so this is, again, the fourth platform is primarily, oops, sorry about that. That was my timer to make sure I'm on time. Um, so this was the Durul platforms right now, there are two finalists. Uh, they both were tasked or mandated to look at solving the cost per bit per Hertz kind of a problem, right? There's the delivery problem of what will motivate a actual network operator uh, to actually deploy in these rural areas. And how does on the other end on the economics make sense is the ARPU, the average revenue per user uh, justifying in investment in these cool new futuristic technologies. Deploying 5G is no easy feat. And to do so in a very diverse, um, uh, sparsely populated uh, space, it, it just doesn't make sense. And that's what we are sort of hearing. But NSF, the FCC really want to make an impact in this particular arena and area. So what we tasked the teams who are buying um, right now is what can you do that is going to stimulate this ecosystem to bring together a diversity of either RF technologies, um, if not access network, then backhaul um, technologies. So cost efficient, maybe, and including millimeter waves. So everything is in play um, uh, right now, right? Microwave backhaul, that's already been a workhorse in rural areas. Can we do it with millimeter wave? Can we do it with mesh techniques? 
And then the other element uh, with rural, because it seems to be very closely aligned with our uh, with the agricultural domain, with uh, where the food basket um, is. So ag, ag becomes very important. So these two platforms uh, were chosen primarily because they showed the breadth of where um, their technical expertise on the wireless domain is, but they also brought their application users in the ag domain uh, to do actual experimentation. And again, I'm no agricultural expert, but I can throw some experiments out there that um, are being discussed and talked about around phenotyping. So if any of you is an ag researcher, understands people have you know uh, cameras pointed at plants as they grow to understand how growth is happening. And right now there is no way or there is no network that caters to this group. Uh, livestock monitoring. So, you know, if anybody has been out to um, the middle Americas where there are large sort of farms uh, that, that provide poultry or pork or, or uh, bovine, you need monitoring for that uh, for health purposes uh, to make sure. And all of these don't have any network elements. So primary motivation from the NSF side, the consortium side and the power program was to try to make an impact and to attract us researchers. I, you know, how many of us, you know, being so disconnected away, and I know NCSU is a very strong agricultural program, so you're pretty tightly connected into this uh, uh, domain, but the notion was, can we actually bring the wireless researchers, excite that ecosystem to deliver uh, solutions, and then make an impact to our industry partners and operators to actually understand and see that a justification has been made. There are key technologies that are looking at this primarily, not just from a technology perspective, but actually the end goal, which is to provide cost-effective uh, solutions. The other last thing I'll just um, uh, state here is uh, government has a big role. So the FCC in its new um, uh, initiatives and programs, and I believe the new chairwoman is uh, going to be pushing that pretty hard, is looking at everything that I talked about earlier with respect to open RAN uh, to bring down the cost of delivery. And, and there are mandates that the FCC is putting in place for these rural network operators to deploy these innovative open brand solutions in their networks to drive down the cost. And that way you, you have the ability to actually justify these new technologies um, because it is still quite shameful that we have 2G technology and 2G networks lit up in a lot of the rural areas right now because there is just no reason to upgrade. And, and that causes you know, lots of other socioeconomic issues as well. Sorry, long-winded answer, but uh, thanks Mihai for that question. That's a great, a great answer, and and uh, um, you're absolutely right. I know that NC State is is uh, very much involved in, in trying to make those connections with with the rural parts of the state and uh, elsewhere. And in fact, I'll, I'll I know Mikhail had one more question, but I'll jump over him and come back because another yeah. uh, individual here posted. Yeah, I, I uh, related... that. yeah no, if you... I can address that, right? So yeah. mm -hmm. the 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 need for fiber optics, I think that's always a contentious. Um, kind of an issue. And I think the, the goal is with 5G and all of these cool, innovative wireless infrastructure technologies. And there's been a lot of investment looking at millimeter wave uh, backhaul techniques, um, microwave uh, techniques, because the investment required for fiber and the companies, which is a very, very small set of people who do this, um, there needs to be massive business justification uh, to, to make that case. So a lot of innovation has happened. A lot of cool startups are there, even including the big four uh, companies, Facebook and Google have initiatives that are addressing this. Um, Google primarily with its X initiative uh, has a free, free space optical solution uh, that allows you to sort of close the digital divide. Uh, millimeter wave mesh techniques from Facebook are, are also available there. Again, I'm not here to comment in any uh, political capacity or put down fiber in favor of 5G. But that's where the FCC is really trying to pay attention to make sure those last mile uh, coverage areas are not necessarily underserved or not served just because there's no business justification to be made. And how do we put technology to good use um, is, is the sentiment that you know, our federal agency partners are, are really looking at. Yeah, if I, if I could ask a follow-up question to that, and I think this concerns the idea of getting the internet to places that traditionally maybe have had trouble getting high bandwidth, but where does space come in, into all this? We hear a lot in the news about satellites and, and using that and as a method to distribute internet. So where does that come in? Thank you for keeping me honest. And I think this, I need to go back to Mihal's question because that's a key piece that I totally forgot to, to mention in the rural broadband uh, platform. Uh, SATCOM is, has been sort of built in as an ask of that platform is to support 
uh, satellite based uh, communication and obviously you know let us evaluate and look at it now given the new programmatic um, um, uh, elements that are also available in in satellite so there are startups that we are debating oh, sorry we're discussing uh, with to uh, that are able to provide you software defined radios and you know some of the programs that NASA is funding right now and the European Space Agency is funding is looking at programmatic uh, uh, radios that can be put out into the you know low Earth orbits um, and and the Starlink satellite that SpaceX is working on is also being uh, discussed um, from us. So yes, Satcom is is very for the fourth platform we are very strongly looking at um, uh, that piece. And again, as these big major players, Amazon and SpaceX, et cetera, get into that business, does that really drive the cost down? And then we also have new um, uh, entrants, Legado Networks and Dish, uh, who are traditionally very strong in the satellite domain, beginning to think about um, deploying 5G networks over their satellite offering. So a really, really you know, interesting time. And, and that's, that's actually a key thing, I believe, on the rural broadband platform that's going to be very interesting for our uh, researchers to, for the first time, actually get our hands onto something that would be programmable, but in the low mid earth um, uh, geo orbit uh, space. Fantastic. Awesome. So I guess, yeah, Mikhail had one more question about yeah. supporting commercial hardware in the Coliseum. Yes. So we have uh, the capability exists. Uh, the ability to sort of uh, insert uh, actual hardware in the loop in, into Colosseum. Right now we are engaging, and, and again, this is about trying to find the right stakeholder who actually needs this. Um, so we have a couple of different uh, agencies we are under discussion with because we need somebody um, to be the representative user uh, to provide us those, those new actual uh, commercial uh, grade hardware or radios that we can insert. Uh, into you, the the USRP or software defined Coliseum infrastructure. So right now, it's it's a waiting game. We're just trying to find the right stakeholder. But right now, nothing technically stops us from bringing commercial uh, radio, hooking it up into the the channel emulator, and allowing for experimentation uh, to happen. So again, if there is a need, Mihail, you know, we we'll let's talk, and we can absolutely make that happen. Great, thank you. So we're actually right on time and we got through all the, the questions as well. And uh, so I wanna take this opportunity to once again, thank you for the, the presentation. It was very, very interesting. And I'm glad that uh, we got to see how AirPaw fits into the overall uh, effort that's going on here. So for the students that are in the audience, I think it's an opportunity to pursue as well. <laughs> but uh, we appreciate yeah, the, the perspective. We can get them excited and motivated uh, here. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's it for today. Thank you very much to the audience who attended and um, we appreciate everyone coming in and uh, please keep an eye out for our future colloquia and seminars. Uh, this was recorded and, and it will be available on our website. I know that some uh, folks have meetings that pop in and out. So we try to make that available for them as well. Awesome. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Manu. We really thank appreciate so it. And we hope you have a nice day and a good weekend. Thanks. Thanks to everyone. Thanks for the invitation again. Take care. Thank you.